Hello, BookTube, and we're back for another essay, and for the moment, we're going to stick with Claude A. Prance uh, for this one. Uh, there's many more in the volume, but uh, we'll do this one, then we'll move on to someone else and come back to him at some point. Um, this is obviously from The Laughing Philosopher, a further miscellany on books, booksellers, and book collecting, published in 1976 by uh, Villers Publications. <clears throat> and this is a longer essay than uh, the other was I've read. Uh, it's called The Cheapest Booksellers in the World. Uh, he starts out with a couple quotes uh, as well. So we'll start with the quotes. Give me the man who, with a few, shil a few spare shilling, goes out uh, into the town and who hoovers around the second-hand bookshops and who balances the value of this book and that, the value to him, before he lays down his money and takes up his treasure, Egament. Of all the pleasures, noble and refined which form the taste and cultivate the mind, the feast of reason, which from reading springs, to reasoning man the highest solace brings. Tis books a lasting pleasure can supply, charm while we live, and teach us how we die. From James Lockington's shop bill written by himself. And now the essay starts in uh, proper... Uh, during the last years of the 18th century and the early part of the 19th, one of the sites of London was a vast edifice on the southwest corner of Finsbury Square. Uh, the bookshop of Lackington, Allen and Company, which carried over its main entrance the words, cheapest booksellers in the world, and above that, an imposing legend, Temple of the Muses. The building was surmounted by a dome, and the interior of the shop was so large that it was said a coach and four horses were driven round inside at the opening. Some say it was the Lord Mayor's coach. In the centre was a great circular counter from behind which numerous assistants dealt with the many customers. There was a broad staircase leading to the lounging rooms and to a series of galleries containing the vast stock of the business. Prominently displayed were notices stating that all sales or were for cash only, and that the lowest price acceptable was clearly marked on each book. The creator of the huge concern was James Lockington, Lackington, uh, who was born in 1746 at Wellington in Somerset. Uh, the eldest of 11 children and the son of a drunken shoemaker who died in a ditch. The family was supported mainly by the mother, who's, who worked 19 hours a day, but even so, could not afford to continue to pay the two pence a week needed to keep the eldest son at school, and he left to work after his young. He left to look after his younger brothers and sisters, and to help supplement the family income. At the age of ten, he was carrying apple pies about the streets for a baker, and so successful was he that he soon added almanacs to his wares. In 1760, he was bound apprentice to the, to a shoemaker at Taunton and where he was converted to Wesleyism. For a payment of three halfpence a week, he was taught to read by one of his master's sons, and soon he read avidly. He says his eyes were so good that he often read by the light of the moon, candles being scarce. At first he read only Wesleyan authors, but gradually passed to philosophical works, and to Plato, Seneca, Plutarch, Epicurus, uh, a special favorite and then to Voltaire and Tom Paine. As a result, he broke away from the Methodists. He says his favorite novelists were Cervantes, Fielding, Smollett, Stern, and Le Sage, but this may have been later in his life when his interests were in higher literature. After his apprenticeship, he worked as a German journeyman shoemaker and in 1770 married a dairymaid named Nancy Smith, whom he had courted on and off for seven years. She helped him with the shoemaking, but their combined income was rarely more than 12 shillings a week. Nevertheless, um, this love of books was, uh, his love of books was such that he spent his last two shillings and sixpence on a copy of Young's Night Thoughts instead of a Christmas dinner. Uh, it, it says much for his wife that he was able to convince her of the merit of this action by the argument. Had I bought a dinner, we should have eaten it tomorrow, and the pleasure would have uh, been soon over. 
but should we live 50 years longer, we shall have night thoughts to feast upon. In 1773, he decided to move to London and left his wife in Taunton. He rejoined the Wesleyans and obtained enough work to enable him to bring his wife to London within a month. The following year, a Wesleyan friend told him of a shop to let in Featherston Street in the parish of St. Luke's, and he decided to start business there on his own as a shoemaker and as a bookseller. He had a stock of books worth about five pounds, and he borrowed a further five pounds from a Wesleyan friend, uh, kept uh, Wesleyan, uh, oh, sorry, from a Wesleyan fund, um, kept to help needy members of the Brotherhood. But he and his wife lived so frugally that in six months he had increased his stock to 25 pounds in value, and he moved to a shop in 46 Chiswell Street, abandoning shoemaking, abandoning shoemaking to devote himself solely to book selling. He sold mainly old divinity, and owing to his religious leanings at the time, he destroyed any books which were written by free thinkers. He later said that he became a bookseller because he loved books and would then uh, always have plenty to read. Both he and his wife were seriously ill f uh, of a fever in 1775, probably through overwork and lack of fresh air. He relates to his, in his memoirs that he, is, he had not his sisters and two friends locked up. Uh, he had... He relates in his memoirs that had not his sisters and two friends locked up his shop for him for safety, all his possessions would have been stolen. Such was the rapacity of the nurses who looked after them. Lack Lackington recovered, but his wife died in November, and although he mourned her loss, he says, I got rid of my any sorrow as fast as I could, thinking that I could not uh, give a better proof of my having loved my late wife than by getting another as soon as I could. Uh, in January 1776, let's read that again. Um, although he mourned his, her loss, he says, I got rid of my sorrow as fast as I could, thinking that I could not give a better proof of my having loved my late wife than by getting another as soon as I could. Yes, I read that correctly. In January 1776, he married Dorcas Turton, a schoolmistress mistress who was immoderately fond of, uh, fond of books and frequently read until the early morning. Uh, she was a great help to her husband's business, for her love of books made her a willing assistant. Among the authors which Lackington read at this time was Thomas Amory's Love of John Buncle, later a favorite book of both Lamb and Hazlitt. From the reading, he again became a critic of Methodism. From this reading, he again became a critic of Methodism, in spite of the help he had received from some of its members at various periods of his life. <clears throat> he uh, maintains that he had uh, heard John Wesley state in Bristol that he could never keep a bookseller six months in his flock. In 1778, his business had... Uh, need of more capital, and a friend, John Dennis, an oil man in Cannon Street, who was also a book collector and possessed a library of mystical and alchemical books, offered to become a partner. He must have bought a fair amount of capital, for Lackington was enabled to double his stock, which was now considerable. Soon after this, he produced his first catalogue, published in 1779, under the name of J. Lackington and Company, and listing no fewer than 12,000 volumes. This catalogue caused some amusement in the uh, book trade, for it contained many errors due to Lackington's want of education and Dennis's inexperience in bibliography. Foreign titles in particular caused Lackington much difficulty, difficulty. At one time he tried to learn French, but gave it up feeling that he had begun too late, and he quotes... Uh, Helvetius, no man acquires any new ideas after 45 years of age. He read, therefore, translations of the classics and inserted the original titles in his catalogues as well as he could. He says, when sometimes I happen to put the genitive or de deative case instead of the nominative 
or accusative, my customers kindly considered this a venial feat, fault, which they readily pardoned and bought the books notwithstanding. However, he sold 20 pounds worth of books the first week after the catalog was issued, and thus encouraged Dennis lent the business a further 200 pounds for additional stock. After two years, however, he objected to the large purchases his partner was making, and the, di and the disagreement led to the dissolution of the partnership in 1780. In the same year, Lackington decided to sell books only for cash and to refuse credit to any persons, no matter what their position might be. He was led to this decision because of a difficulty of collecting payments from purchases, uh, purchasers, and many had uh, many bad debts had incurred. Other booksellers laughed uh, the idea to uh, laughed the idea to scorn, for telling his bankruptcy. But he persisted in spite of difficulties, and time proved the merit of his action, for he was able to lower his prices and attract more buyers. Generally, these prices were lower than his competitors, and the successes of his plan was mirrored in the second catalogue issued in 1784 and listed 30,000 books, mostly of a better kind, and it contained 820 pages. Although the cheapness of his books attracted buyers, he had not foreseen that sellers would often avoid him, reasoning that since he sold cheaply, he would offer little for their books. He overcame this by fixing a price for a library or a parcel of books offered to him. If the seller was dissatisfied, he was free to go elsewhere, but paid Lackington 5% for the valuation. Usually other booksellers often offered less and the sellers often returned to accept lacking his price, whereupon their 5% was refunded to them. If the seller fixed his own price, no valuation fee was charged, the bookseller merely uh, buying or refusing uh, in the normal way. At this time, he fell foul of his fellow booksellers for another reason. It was customary for them to meet at trade sales, dealing mostly with remainders, and to sell among themselves as many as seventy or eighty thousand volumes after dinner. From one half to three fourths of these they destroyed, selling the rest at uh, or near the full published price. Anyone f uh, failing to follow this custom was excluded from the trade sales. At first, Lackington uh, conformed, but after a time felt that he could improve his business by a departure from this practice. Despite great opposition from members of the ring, he was successful in selling at what price he chose, and as this was cheaply, he maintains it was to the great benefit of purchasers. Often he sold at half or even a quarter of the published price. Although he seldom bought manuscripts and rarely published new books, he purchased large quantities of individual volumes, sometimes as many as 6,000 copies, while of Watt Psalms, he uh, once had 10,000 copies in stock, as well as the uh, same number of his hymns. He also kept many books in a variety of bindings to suit the taste of customers. He sometimes purchased 5,000 pounds worth of books in an afternoon. Although uh, fire insurance dates back to the Great Fire of London, it was not so common in the 18th century, but Lackington uh, prudently insured his stock against loss of fire. For 13 years he did his own cataloging and he says that during that time he had no assistant and could value books uh, could value books adequately that could have, who could have valued books adequately uh, the strain on both his wife and himself was thus considerable and their health suffered a few years later they decided to take tours of provincial bookshops which also uh, would serve as a holiday so by the time he must have had reliable staff to leave in charge during his absence. The first tour was 1787. They repeated it in 1790. Lackington states that generally he found the booksellers disappointing. Only in York, Leeds, and Edinburgh were there a few good shops. He made some purchases but was convinced that London was the grand emporium of Great Britain for, uh, Britain, Britain for book. Great Britain for books. He had by this time worked up a business of surprising dimensions. He kept account books in his shop open to the scrutiny of staff of his staff and freely declared its his gains. 
1791, he says his profit was 4,000 pounds. In 1792, it had risen to 5,000, and he was selling 100,000 uh, volumes a year. He never spent more than two-thirds of his profit, but his prosperity was such that he was able to keep a uh, carriage, and characteristically, he had painted uh, on his on its doors the model small profits to great things he also bought a country house first at Upper Holloway then at Merton in Surrey and he kept saddle horses for himself and his wife in 1793 he had thoughts of retirement and that summer sold one-fourth shares in the business to Robert Allen who had been brought up in the shop and was well acquainted with the Lackington way of doing business he now had two shops in Chiswell Street but the following year saw the greatest move to the palatial premises in Finsbury Square. The square had only been built some five years previously and consisted of very handsome houses and extensive gardens. It covered the fields mentioned by uh, Pennant as a great gymnasium of our capital, the resort of wrestlers, boxers, runners, and football players. History repeated, repeated itself here, for I remember seeing football played there by office workers in their lunch hour on waste ground left after the bombing of London in the Second World War. It was uh, this new shop which was named the Temple of the Muses, and the name figures in contemporary prints, which also state that more than a half million volumes were constantly in stock. The frontage was said to be 140 feet, and the building, which was four or five stories high, consisted of a variety of departments, including even book binders. In 1794, a catalogue was issued said to list above 100,000 volumes. When Lackington was at the shop, a flag was flown from the dough. Uh, in 1795, he issued copper tokens, which bore his portrait at, on the obverse and on the reverse a figure which might have been one of the muses but was said to be uh, f fame blowing a trumpet and the legend halfpenny of J. Lackington and Company cheapest booksellers in the world on the edge was inscribed a payable at the Temple of Muses this activity was of course not confined to Lackington for owing to the debased and unsatisfactory state of the regal copper coinage by 18, uh, 1787. It had been customary for some years for tradesmen to issue uh, these tokens which they undertook to honor. Millions uh, were in circulation and among booksellers who issued them were John Murray's predecessor Thomas Miller and Thomas Spence of Chancellery Lane and they were also issued by publishers and librarians. Peter Pinder who uh, had little good to say of anyone, wrote in 1795 an ode to the hero of Finsbury Square, London, which began, O thou whose mind, unfettered, undistinguished, soars like the lark into the empty air, whose arch exploits, whose arch exploits by a subtlety devised, have stamped renown on Finsbury's new square, great hero list, whilst his sly muse repeats the nuptial ode the prowess great in sheets this is accompanied by a caricature of Lackington mounting his carriage upon the st uh, steps formed by the bible uh, Tilson sermons and the common prayer while under one arm is a book entitled my own memoirs and out of his pocket protrudes papers labeled puffs and lifts for my book in February 1795, Lackington's wife Dorcas died at the early age of 45, but following his earlier precept, he married another, a relative of hers, in June the same year. In a notice to his um, old Pinder, uh, maintains that in the death of his first wife, Lackington had advertised for a second, stating that no one who had not £20,000 need uh, apply. But Dorcas certainly did not bring him this amount, for she was the daughter of a man who had failed in business and was supported solely by her efforts as a schoolmistress. Although the shop continued to flourish, Lackington had made up his mind to retire, and in 1798 he made over his share of the business to his cousin George Lackington, who had been with him at the, from the, since the age of 13, and now became head of the firm. 
selling cheaply for cash still continued uh, to be the policy and still brought great rewards. The catalog for 1800 listed over 200,000 volumes, and that for 1803 is said to be uh, described upwards of 800,000. Other activities were added, such as publishing and a writer in the Repository of Arts in 1809, stated uh, that the number of persons employed as clerks, printers, and binders always exceeded 100, and at times a free uh, continental intercourse has been uh, nearly double. Uh, the stock being formed at an extended scale and in view and a view to the supply of the American and other foreign markets. Another partner in Lackington Allen and Company was a man named Hughes, but since he was also leasy of Sadler's Wells, he may not have devoted much time to the business. Others entered and left the firm, and in 1822, the partners consisted of George Lackington, Hughes, Arding, uh, Maver, and Leopard consequently reducing to Harding and Leopard. On George Lackington's retirement, the business was removed to Pall Mall East. The imposing premises in Finsbury Square seemed to have been occupied by booksellers in the 1830s under the name of James and Company. Temple of the Muses, former Lackington's, the famous building was, however, burnt down sometime around 1840. Many booksellers who later became distinguished obtained their early uh, training at Lackington Shop. Both John Taylor and James Augustus Hesse uh, worked there and later joined partnership uh, to become the famous publishers of the London Magazine Circle. John Taylor, uh, when, there, when there as a youth, was paid seven, six, seven shillings sixpence a week uh, with dinner. But not satisfied with this, he left Lackington for better pay uh, with Werner and Hood until he opened his own business in 1806. Adam Black, founder of the Great Edinburgh House, also worked for Lackington, Allen and Company for about three years. After his retirement, James Lackington went to live in Gloucestershire and moved to Alveston and since he had by this time rejoined the Wesleyans, built there a small chapel, and himself became a preacher. Subsequent moves were to Taunton and finally to Budley Salterton, uh, in both of which towns he erected and endowed chapels. He died of apoplexy in 1850 on his 70th birthday. As early as 1790, he had published memoirs of the, 40, of the 45 first years of the life of James Lackington written by himself and later enlarged and often reprinted. The 13th edition appeared in 1810 and it was still being reprinted in 1827 when a German version was printed in Hamburg in 1795. The book was a triple dedication, first to the public, second to respectable booksellers, and lastly to sordid uh, booksellers that is to be those who had opposed and and criticized him. In the form of letters to a friend, the book presents a most interesting account of the life of an unusual man and of the book-selling conditions of the day, but it is an overloaded, uh, it, but it is overloaded with anecdotes mainly irrelevant, poetical quotations and abuse of the Wesleyans. It contains two letters alleged to be written by Wesley, but their authenticity is said to be extremely doubtful he does, however, show great respect for John Wesley personally. Lackington's memoirs contain a specimen of uh, his shop bill written in verse and praise of reading, no doubt his own composition. At the end of the book, he adds Lackington's epitaph, which he says he wrote in a churchyard at Merton while sitting on one of the gravestones. It starts with, Good passenger, one moment stay and commonplace, uh, contemplate this heap of clay. Tis Lackington that claims a pause, who strove with death but lost his cause. A stronger genius ne'er need be than many a merry year was he. The whole epitaph runs to thirty lines and concludes philosophically and characteristically with much had he read and much he had thought 
and yet you see he's come to naught, or out of print, as they would say, to the revised some future day, to be revised some future day, free from errata and ad- with addition, a new and complete edition. <laughs> Um, in 1804, he published the Confessions of James Lockington, late bookseller at the Temple of the Muses, which include two letters on the bad consequences of having daughters educated at boarding schools. In this book, he made some amends for the criticism of the Methodists uh, contained in his earlier book, but rather ungraciously says that his wife Dorcas led him astray from them for the second time by her reading of gay, uh, frothy narratives. A less interesting work than the memoirs, it called forth a reply written partially in verse to ridicule Lackington. The author was given as Alan MacLeod, which Londis says is a fictitious name, and the book has been called A Futile Performance. Lackington maintained that the sale of books had been increased by book clubs and circulating libraries, much to his benefit. And it is true that he was fortunate in coming to time, coming at a time when the demand for knowledge was extending. He was an arid egotist, and writes in his memoirs of the great man I now feel myself and hope you acknowledge me to be. It is said that when it was proposed to erect a statue in Finsbury Square, he offered to erect his own and pay for it, but the offer was not accepted. That his memory is not entirely forgotten, however, is provided by the existence of a street adjoining the present Finsbury Square named Lackington Street. In spite of his eccentricities, he was a man of ideas, of great independence of character, he was a very gener- he was very generous to his many poor relations. He read widely so as to be a- as to be able to recommend his wares and to be the better tradesman, but he admits that his knowledge was superficial. He was probably the first bookseller to, to make a fortune by speculating systematically in remainders. The late Maurice Hewitt, in a delightful essay, summed him up as a large bookseller, a cheap bookseller and for aught that appears an honest bookseller. So, that ends the essay. Um, <laughs> it just, uh, yeah, it is quite long, as I say, but I'll take a couple more minutes. Uh, the ones I wanted to say there, uh, I've, I've known about the book tokens and booksellers doing that, <clears throat> but that just, uh, I just love to be able to start collecting these because and when I did a little bit of searching, it looks like they, they were done everywhere. They were done in the United States, all across the world, basically. Uh, book tokens were were created. Uh, but he sounds like quite a character. Uh, now back to Prance. Uh, he was born in 1906 and died in 19... Uh, sorry, died, born in 1906 and died in 2002. So it was 96 years old almost, or it just past 96. Now... He started out, he, he worked uh, in most of his life in banking, and uh, he retired at the age of 60, and as in the last essay we saw that he uh, moved to an island uh, in the Mediterranean in the 60s, and then did extensive traveling and wound up in Canberra in Australia. And it looks like in 2001 or 2002, maybe before he died, uh, the National Library of Australia bought a large chunk of his library. Uh, because he had a big collection of of books um, on Lamb, um, Hazlitt, and a whole bunch of uh, poets, uh, John Clare apparently as well. So they they, they hoovered up what they thought uh, they want, well, what they wanted. Um, there's other books he wrote. There's another collection of essays which I can't seem to find. Um, there's a book on on Lamb. He's written a book on Evie Lucas, which I'd like to get. He also, with someone else, uh, did uh, an index to the London Magazine. Um, but yeah, so um, he's yeah. So it's it just yeah. I, I find him a kind of an interesting person. So I definitely want to find his other books eventually. Uh, not you know going bankrupt for them because a few of them are kind of expensive for some reason. Don't know why. Uh, but anyway, I'll end it there, and we'll be off to someone else next time for uh, the essay. Thank you, book two.